Good afternoon. My name is Elisa Sladzinska, and I work for the City of Chicago Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection, BACP. Welcome to the BACP Business Education Workshop Webinar Series. We have adapted our regular business education workshops at City Hall into these webinars until further notice. On behalf of our commissioner, Rosa Scarino, I want to inform you that business licenses can be processed online where applicable by visiting chicagobusinessdirect.org. And I will put all emails and websites that I reference into the chat box so you could look at them there as well. And if you are part of the Business Start Certificate Program, you can get credit for joining this webinar by sending an email to BACP Outreach at cityofchicago.org. If you want to learn about the program, please visit chicago.gov backslash business workshops. To help guide your business and employees during phase four of Chicago's reopening process, please visit chicago.gov backslash reopening. Also, BCP and the City of Chicago's Office of Emergency Management and Communications created Shy Biz Emergency Alerts. You can opt in to receive targeted emergency alerts for the business community. If you are interested, please visit chicago.gov backslash shy biz alerts. And during this webinar, we encourage participants to ask questions by using the chat box. Please send your questions to all panelists so that the host and panelists can see the questions. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar presentation. And today's webinar will be choosing the right legal entity, a small business entity workshop. It will be presented by Akili Parnell of the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Welcome, Akili. Thank you, um, and thank everyone for uh, joining us today for today's presentation, choosing the right legal entity, a uh, small business entity workshop. Uh, my name is Akili Parnell, um, as we said. I manage our small business program at Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Uh, Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights is a uh, civil rights legal organization. Uh, we are lawyers and advocates that work to secure racial equity and economic opportunity for all. And uh, we have a small business program that is couched within our equitable community development and housing practice where we work to uh, promote economic development and historically underinvested communities, um, especially communities of color. Um, and so I manage that program where we do policy advocacy and provide legal assistance and connect small businesses and entrepreneurs with legal assistance uh, to support economic development in the city. So today we'll be talking about choosing the right legal entity. Um, you know, as an entrepreneur, an aspiring entrepreneur or someone who's looking to uh, start a new business or expand their existing business, um, one of the most important considerations that you need to uh, think about when, when starting that new line of business or starting that new business is what sort of new entity you should choose. And depending on, you know, what it is you want to accomplish, how you want to finance your business, how many partners you'll have, and many other things that I'll talk about today, um, that would, you know, those considerations and issues will impact which entity you choose. And so, the goal for today is to sort of help you as an expiring entrepreneur or an entrepreneur think about uh, that from a legal perspective and think about how the legal structure that you choose uh, will impact how you run your business. And so today we're gonna you know, discuss four basic forms of business structures, uh, the sole proprietorship, partnership, the limited liability company, and a corporation. Uh, we'll, also touch briefly on co-ops and sort of how those fall into, you know, one or both of these categories or, and then how that can kind of be its own thing really briefly. And again, as we mentioned before, uh, feel free to add any questions in the chat box and we'll say those 
before the end, and uh, we'll try to address any questions that any of the participants have today. Um, a little bit about background about me. Um, to for context, I was a, a corporate and securities attorney, a business attorney uh, for several years before I joined the lawyers committee to manage our small business program. So, uh, you know, I've worked in private firms advising, you know, small and large companies, um, venture firms on a wide range of uh, business and transactional matters. Uh, and then I was also an uh, in-house counsel for a uh, fast growing uh, startup at the time, company that grew into a larger company. So um, we've really seen, you know, um, how businesses develop from a variety of industries and in all different aspects and at all different stages in the life cycle of a business. Uh, so that informs sort of how we think about things. So one of the overarching considerations um, that you're going to need to think about as an entrepreneur is uh, what, what kind of control, how much control do I wish to have over my business? Um, you, know, at, you know, as businesses grow, usually uh, the control is less concentrated. It sort of diffuses out among different investors and operators um, and employees. Um, but, you know, when you first start out, that's one of the most important decisions you want to make. And depending on how much control you wish to have over your business, um, you know, one form of legal entity make more, may make more sense than another. Um, another really important issue that you need to consider is liability. And so how will you protect your personal assets? Um, and that's an important consideration when it comes to forming a legal entity because often most many of the legal entities are designed specifically to protect your own personal assets, your own personal home and, you know, car and savings and all these things from, uh, you know, the legal liabilities that your business may incur. And so certain uh, legal entities provide that protection and then some don't. And so that's something else to think about if that's really important. Um, then you know, you will likely want to choose one of two legal entities. Um, then another issue is taxes. How do you want to be taxed? Uh, will you need access to business earnings for personal reasons? Um, and so depending on if you want any income generated through your business to just be personal income, you know, you'll make certain decisions about the legal structure of your business um, versus if you want to separate uh, the business taxes from your own personal income. Um, there's different entities and sometimes you can accomplish either or both, or not necessarily both, but either with uh, different entities, but uh, that's something that's really important to think about. And then another is complexity, which legal structure will provide you with the most flexibility. Um, you know, some smaller, you know, something like an LLC is often the most flexible sort of legal structure that could provide you with the most liability protection and the most control. Um, but then there's, you know, certain limit, limits on um, how you raise capital with that form of, of entity. But, um, you know, you, you want to, certain entities like corporations are a little bit more complex than others. So if you don't want to deal with lots of complexity and you want to manage your business uh, in a way that's the most simple, then um, you, you might want to choose one entity over another. And then ease and cost. Um, depending on the legal structure that you choose, um, you know, your cost of just maintaining that, that legal status um, may be higher or lower depending on what you choose. And so that's something that's going to be really important depending on where you are in your own, uh, your own journey as an entrepreneur um, and in the development of your business. So we'll talk about uh, entity formation briefly in the, in the different entities again in a little bit more detail. So the sole proprietorship, um, that's essentially no entity is where you just go into business uh, for yourself um, under, you know, either a trade name or, or your own name. Uh, so that could be, you know, Jane and John's, you know, pizza shop and, you know, your individual name is on the lease or uh, holds title to the property and signs all the contracts on behalf of a business. Um, this is a very common form. It's the cheapest to, to form and to manage. Uh, there's no, no paperwork other than, you know, uh, a trade name or fictitious name, um, you know, something other than your own personal name if you choose to do that, but you don't even necessarily have that. So 
that's the sole proprietorship. That's uh, pretty straightforward to form. Uh, and the, the second legal name we want to talk about is the partnership. And partnerships can look like a lot of different things. Um, generally, a partnership is a situation where two people come together uh, you know, to do business and they make an agreement on the terms of that business and the sharing of, of profits that are generated through that line of business. Um, and we'll get into more details about what that is. But, um, you know, depending on the form of partnership, there can be, you know, no formal paperwork that you have to file with the state necessarily um, with some, especially professional uh, partnerships and things like that. If you're a, a doctor or a lawyer or something like that, then there'll be things you may need to file. Um, but, you know, generally partnerships uh, include less paperwork than these latter entities. Um, so the next one is the limited liability corporation. Uh, it's the LLC, which you hear about a lot. This is uh, a newer entity, but not so new anymore. Uh, most people have heard of it. Uh, so this one provides you with uh, a formal legal structure and liability protection, which we'll get into some of the details about that. Um, that's formed by filing um, certain forms with the state. We'll talk about what those are. Um, and then the corporation, this is a uh, popular, well-known uh, legal entity, business legal entity. Uh, there's different kinds of corporations, but generally there's a corporation, you have shareholders, um, you have certain executive officers and directors. Um, this is formed by filing uh, articles of incorporation with the state, the Secretary of State. Um, and then there's certain uh, you know, things that you need to do throughout the year. Um, to maintain your status uh, in good standing with the state. And then there's also cooperatives, as I mentioned before. And cooperatives um, can be, you know, they can be its own legal entity, like a limited cooperative association we'll talk about, or a cooperative can be a corporation, or it can be an LLC. Um, you know, but the, the basic idea behind cooperatives is that they're uh, democratically owned and controlled, meaning the control is, uh, not concentrated in, in, in you know, or not concentrated or focused on just one person. Um, that you know, decisions about the business are made by a collective of individuals that you know, work or own um, the assets of, of the business. Um, and so, you can sort of become a cooperative uh, by following certain uh, standards, either set by the state or uh, that are generally acknowledged um, throughout the country. I'll talk a little bit about what those are, but, you know, when it comes to forming an entity, you want to think about whether or not you've already formed an entity. Are you already in business? If you're already in business as a sole proprietorship, you know, and you want to form an entity, you got to think about what does that mean? What does it look like to transfer any existing contracts or anything into a new entity's name? What are the implications of that? If you haven't started business yet, it's a lot easier to just form an entity and have all the assets and contracts in that business's name. Um, again, do you have an agreement? Are you already in partnership with someone else? That could impact, you know, what it means to try to form an entity and transfer your business assets to that. Um, are you current with your state filings? If you wanted to change entities and you're not current, that will impact um, those things. And then the same related to your business licenses. If you're a sole proprietor and you have, um, you know, a business license, um, approved by the city, issued by the city, but maybe you're not current with certain compliance um, rules around that licensure that will impact um, the formation of your new entity. Um, and then you also want to think about how do you want to raise capital? Um, you know, certain entities are easier to raise capital for through uh, than others. And so that's something to think about. Um, and how will ownership and the profits be managed and handled? and distributed uh, to any investors that you have. Certain entities are easier to do that than others. And are you concerned about liability? Um, and then again, what's your succession plan? Um, so here's a quick overview of the various laws that um, you know, sort of govern how uh, business entities in the state uh, are, are run and are formed. Um, you know, I go into all these details, it's, it's a lot and definitely uh, advise you to seek out an attorney, but certainly would encourage uh, individuals to take a look at some of it and, you know, just get a sense of what all is there and what all can be addressed. 
Um, but certainly if you want to try to navigate this in any detail, um, you should definitely reach out to an expert, but, you know, it covers corporations, nonprofits, LLCs, partnerships, associations, um, and more. So, yeah, as I, as I mentioned before, the sole proprietorship, um, this is the most simple form of business uh, legal entity. I mean, it's not an actual legal entity, but um, you're not forming anything, but, you know, you start the proprietorship and you, you know, go down to City Hall and you apply for, you know, whatever business license it may be. You want to operate a lemonade stand and, you know, you say Jack's Lemonade Stand is going to be the name and your name is Jack. And, you know, you go out and go into business. Um, and generally, it's just one person and, um, you know, you can have employees, but, you know, all the assets and, 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 and various legal obligations are in that one person's name. And any income that's generated through the sole proprietorship will be personal income to um, to that that business owner. Uh, the advantages again, it's uh, it's really simple. It's the least expensive structure. So you know, if you're on a shoestring, really tight shoestring budget, don't have a ton of money for additional filings that you know might accompany the LLC or the corporation, uh, then you know it might make sense to go with a sole proprietorship. Again, here essentially complete control over any decisions regarding the business. Um, you know, of course, if you, you know, have one business and then go into business with another and you have two sole proprietors that sort of create a partnership, then, you know, that, that's a different story um, over that particular line of business. And we'll get into what that would look like. But generally, if it's just you and your lemonade stand and you own everything, then you have complete control over all the decisions. Um, and then, you know, all the profits come back to you and you have employees. Of course, you'll pay them, but um, the you know sort of net profits that the business generates at the end of the year um, would come back to the sole proprietor. Um, you know, dissolving the business, sort of winding things down, and closing the business is really easy. Um, as is transferring the business is relatively easy for the sole proprietorship. So those are some advantages. Um, and then you know, again, any income and losses are reported on your personal income tax return. So definitely want to talk to an accountant and make sure you have a good understanding of how that will impact your personal finances and tax filings. Um, as far as disadvantages of the sole proprietorship, the law, this is the biggest one. You know, the law does not distinguish between the business and its owner. So if, you know, Dax Lemonade Stand gets sued for, you know, negligence, uh, you know, then essentially Jack is getting sued for negligence. Um, and so you'll be personally liable, have to appear in court for, um, you know, things that the business does right or I mean does wrong. So uh, that's a that's a huge that's potentially a huge liability. Again, it depends on what sort of liability exposure that your line of business um, will create for you. It may be significant, it may be fairly minimal, in which case it's not that much of a worry. I um, mean running a lemonade stand could be a pretty low liability uh, line of business or you know depending on how you run it it could be higher. So that's definitely an important consideration. Uh, to, to think about. Uh, sole proprietors, again, have unlimited liability, so there's no cap on uh, the amount of liability exposure there. Um, and then again, if you have a fictitious name or a, a, a DBA, say your name is, you know, um, you know, Jack, and you want to change the lemonade stand to, you know, the best lemonade stand in Chicago, and that's going to be the title, you need to register that name uh, with the county. Again, there's no formal process for formation, no documentation other than uh, for your, your your DBA, your fictitious name, your business name. Um, and then, of course, you will still need to obtain any necessary federal, state, or local licenses and permits. Um, and so, you know, the actual entity formation is separate from uh, the licensing of that line of business. So that's something you still need to be on top of. Um, and then, you know, you may need an employer uh, identification number. The next one we'll talk about is the, uh, part the partnership. Um, there's different kinds of partnerships. Um, there's a general partnership and then there's a limited partnership. Um, and partnerships can be, a little, a little, you know, a little bit more complex than that. I mean, there's partnerships that, you know, manage, you know, um, lots of money into the billions of dollars. 
And then there's partnerships that are just, you know, uh, two people who decide to, you know, get together and, you know, provide some service on the weekend. And, you know, maybe they just have a handshake agreement and that's it. And so with the general partnership is generally two or more partners contributing uh, money, labor and skills. Um, and they agree to share uh, in their profits and losses. And the terms of that should be reflected in an agreement. That'd be a partnership agreement. You don't have to do that. You could do a handshake agreement um, that, you know, sort of creates all these issues that could arise and, you know, lends itself to some kind of litigation where it's really unclear who should get what, as you can imagine. Um, it, it can come down to a he said, she said thing or a, um, you know, it'll be based on how you all have been sort of operating and what sort of evidence you have and documentation for the agreement that you made, the handshake agreement. It's always best uh, to put it in, in writing. Um, and any lawyers are going to tell you that. And so um, most of the times we like to see or we'll see a partnership agreement. And these can be very complex or they can be very simple. But the goal there, again, is to outline the basic terms of uh, how you're doing business together. And so in particular, you know, how are you going to manage the business and uh, where the money will go? Um, and, you know, in and of itself, you know, there's no necessarily li uh, liability protection, but there are um, you know, limited liability partnerships, which you know, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, you know, the general partnership is the easiest one to do a 50-50 deal where, you know, we split all the profits 50-50 uh, and put that in paper real simple and, you know, you can go on about your business. Um, again, here, personal income. Uh, any income that you create through the partnerships business is personal income to the partners. Um, so, you know, if you decide to split that 50, 50, make hundred K in one year net, you know, then that's, you know, and that's distributed out, then, you know, that's uh, personal income. Then there's also the limited partnership. Um, and so these partnership structures sometimes get complex with, you know, limited partnerships under general partnerships and so on, but um, a limited partnership, you know, has general partners and one or more limited partners who have limited liability and no rights to really manage the business. Um, an agreement is required. Um, the general partners are the ones that would manage the business and then the limited partners are essentially investors. And so they um, like your idea to start a lemonade stand, but they don't want to have anything to do with it. And so they, you know, agree to give you some money in exchange for an ownership interest our uh, economic interest in the business and you set the terms of what that looks like and you put that into your partnership agreement um, and again they have no control over the business but no personal liability or limited liability for uh, the actions of the partnership and any liability that they are exposed to is limited to their investment in the partnership so if they put up 50k to for the business to go do things the business runs into trouble you know that 50k is at risk but um, their personal, you know, assets are not at risk. Again, some of the advantages of the partnership, you know, it uh, can be simple, expensive business to structure uh, and organize. Um, you know, raising capital may is it may be easier with a partnership than, you know, sole proprietorship where you're probably just taking a loan. Um, partnerships may have, you know, complementary skills that they contribute. You know, maybe both partners come in and bring capital, maybe one partner just puts up money and the other runs the business. Uh, you can be pretty flexible here. Um, and then of course, the, like the dealing with the taxes can be easy if it's just, you know, any money you make in buying a, being involved in this business, it's just personal income and you don't have to worry about uh, any sort of necessarily any separate taxes. Um, but that's not always the case. Um, and then there are disadvantages to a partnership, um, you know, each, partner is individually liable for the actions of the other partner in a general partnership. Um, and so if your partner does some crazy stuff, um, you know, everybody, the whole business is, is liable. And so, um, you know, you, you would still be liable for that. You can contract around that and get pretty complex and different stuff, but that's the general setup. Um, and then again, in a partnership, because you are uh, bringing on another party, generally have a little bit less control than you would if you were a sole proprietor or the sole owner of your business. Um, you typically have a partnership. I mean, this is kind of the point. You agree to share profits. So 
Um, not all the money is going into your pocket like uh, maybe perhaps have wanted. Um, and then uh, the business may dissolve upon the withdrawal or death of a partner. So if one partner uh, passes or is incapacitated or decides to leave the business, um, then you know, the business may dissolve. You have to figure out how to transfer or deal with the assets of the business. Um, and then um, in most circumstances, you need to uh, register the partnership with the county. In partnership uh, formation, um, you know, there's no formal process for general partnership. You generally need, you know, uh, federal employer tax ID number. Um, again, you'll need all the necessary local, state, federal licenses for your line of business, which is different for every line of business. Um, if you have a DBA or an assumed name, um, meaning they need to get that. Um, and then you definitely should have a partnership agreement, but again, it's not required. You don't have to file that with the state or anything. Um, for limited partnerships, you know, you'll need to file a certificate of limited partnership with the Secretary of State um, and you know, potentially other appropriate agencies, depending on your line of business. Um, you know, you generally must contain the word limited partnership. Uh, it's required by statute and you have to have a written partnership agreement. Uh, the next entity is the limited liability company. This is the one that we see most often. Um, it's very simple to form. Uh, there is some cost. It's not, you know, necessarily too expensive, but again, that depends on, um, you know, your, your operating budget, your startup budget and where you are. Um, so generally a limited liability company is one or more members. Members are essentially owners of the business. Uh, you can have you know, one owner, you can have a thousand owners. Um, again, this provides unlimited liability. So generally the liability of the business, um, you know, are the liabilities of the business and not the individual owners. Um, again, any money that you put in, you know, invest into the business is at stake as, you know, the, company then you know owns that money and you have ownership in exchange or whatever assets you contributed you come to companies in exchange for your ownership so that is at stake but um you know your personal assets are not um again you should have an operating agreement which is essentially kind of like a partnership agreement um it's kind of like a partnership agreement slash bylaws for a corporation we'll talk about what those are but essentially that agreement would govern um, all the ways that the limited liability company will be managed and at a high level, um, who are the, you know, who are the members, who are the, who are the you know, starting owners, who are going to be the managers, meaning the people that are sort of running the day to day, um, and how are you going to deal with taxes and the distribution of profits? You make 100k at the end of the year net. You know, how do you determine whether or not to just reinvest that into the business or to give some out to investors. Um, and then again, this one provides for uh, pass-through taxation or um, corporate taxation, meaning you can, any, you know, profits that are generated by the business, um, you know, an income can be treated as individual personal income. Um, and you can just file that on your own personal income taxes, or you can treat it as, uh, you know, a corporation and it can be taxed corporation, meaning that um, the money that the business generates is taxed at the corporate level. And then, you know, anything that you are paid for working for the business is taxed uh, as, a, as personal income. So that's what we mean by double taxation. Um, then there's also sort of uh, nonprofit slash C hybrid entity that was mentioned really briefly called the L3C, which is uh, essentially a low profit LLC. Um, but essentially functions like a limited liability, a regular limited liability company. It just has, um, you know, a separate social mission um, that's sort of uh, inherent to, to the entity itself. Some of the advantages here um, are that it offers business owners uh, limited liability protection. Again, it helps protect your personal assets. If you go in the business and the business just completely tanks and gets into all kind of legal trouble and gets into trouble with debtors, um, even with creditors, then, um, you know, your personal assets are protected. If the LLC gets sued, you know, then you don't necessarily have to have your own name in a lawsuit. Um, it would just be the business. Um, so business assets are at risk. 
but not yours. Um, and then again, gives you flexibility on how you want to be taxed. You just want the LLC to to be taxed first, and then any income, any anything that you're paid for working for the business is personal income. This can provide some protection for uh, against audits. And so when you um, elect to be taxed. Uh, Basically, as a as a pass through entity, so that that the money just it goes directly to the owners and the operators. Then you're at a little bit higher risk for uh, getting audited by the IRS, um, and so that can provide some audit protection there. Um, and then typically, there's less paperwork with the LLC versus a corporation. Uh, some of the disadvantages here. Um, is that potentially, depending on how many partners and owners there are, the business may dissolve upon the death of an owner. If there's just one, you know, it's not, um, you know, upon that person's death, and generally the business would dissolve. Uh, and then there's more paperwork here than a sole proprietorship. Um, you know, it's not a ton of uh, paperwork. Generally, just your, you know, your articles of formation. Um, it's you know fairly short form form that you would file with the state, but then if you have your operating agreement as you should, um, that's usually a lot longer document and requires uh, you to engage an attorney in order to draft that. So uh, more paperwork, but generally worth it. And then also it, it costs more to form this, um, usually around two to $300, um, you know, to form it and then to get a registered agent, which is someone that you know, usually it's the businesses, but the individuals who are designated um, and their information is submitted to the state and they're designated to receive correspondence about the LOC, mostly legal correspondence. And so, you know, if you get sued or the state wants to communicate with you about, you know, you haven't made a particular filing or whatever the case is, you haven't paid the tax or something like that, they can receive that correspondence for you. Um, and so that that's usually an additional fee, but not a ton. Maybe you know sometimes around a hundred dollars or less a year. Um, and then with LOCs, you can still be pretty flexible with how you raise capital. Um, you know, but it's a little bit more challenging to raise capital uh, with an LLC than it is a uh, corporation, generally because the LOC all the ownership has to be accounted for, and so you can't say that you know we still have some. Uh, some membership units or ownership sort of reserved and not issued. It needs to be 100%, you know, accounted for at all times. And so you can always, of course, you know, sort of dilute the ownership, the existing ownership. And, you know, dilution is, is, is something you deal with all the time with a corporation, but at least, you know, with a corporation, you can have stock that's sort of set aside and reserved that no particular person owns. So again, uh, the way you form an LOC is by filing articles of organization with the Secretary of State. You pay your filing fees. Um, you, you know, you can generally do this within like 24 to 48 hours if you pay for expedited uh, service. Um, otherwise, it's probably in about a week. Um, and then you'll want to prepare and adopt the operating agreement. There's some calls there. Um, you know, sort of standard operating agreement probably would cost, uh, you know, anywhere from uh, $500 to $100, I mean, up to $1,000 uh, to get an attorney to, to draft that, depending on how complicated it is. You know, uh, the really, really complicated ones cost more than that, again, depending on the firm. Um, but, you know, there are pro bono options for, um, you know, for qualifying small businesses where you can get that done for free, which, which is what I mean by pro bono. Um, again, just like any other business, you'll need to get any necessary licenses and permits and file the required reports with the Secretary of State. So next we'll talk about corporations. Um, you know, corporations are, you know, generally what we think of as these big, huge, multi-state, multinational businesses uh, like Amazon or Google. Um, but, you know, some corporations are really small. Some corporations are you know, mom and pop shops, some, some corporations might, you know, a lemonade stand could be a corporation. Um, it's really just a legal entity. Um, and it's a legal entity that includes shareholders, which are owners. Um, you have to have a board of directors, you have to have some directors. 
um, officers, which would be like CEO, CFO, president, uh, secretary, things like that. Um, and then it offers uh, liability protection. So it's limited liability. Again, the owners of the business, in some cases it's generally the employees of the business are not held liable, personally liable for the actions of the business. Um, you know, in certain instances of like, you know, fraud and things like that, um, you know, you may not be afforded personal protection, but generally, you know, business just goes bad or is sued for you know, something uh, in the regular line of business, in the regular course of business, um, then the liability is limited to the corporation and its assets. Um, then again, a corporation is required by statute to have bylaws, and bylaws are essentially a document that explains how the corporation will be managed and its structure. So talk about you know how many directors will the corporation have, what powers will the directors have when it comes to voting, how many uh, directors need to vote and approve a certain action, what actions can be taken by directors, what actions can be taken by officers, how do you delegate power? Um, you know, this one certainly can get nearly a lot more complex than the others. Um, and, uh, you know, which is why you see corporations, uh, you know, multinational corporations and these big complex business entities using this model. Um, again, in terms of uh, raising capital, you know, that this is the most flexible one, which sort of set up that way, uh, which is why you see publicly traded companies often or almost always are corporations. Um, and then corporations generally pay taxes at the corporate level. And then, you know, any income that, you know, its employees generate by working for the corporation is personal taxes. And so corporations say, you know, it makes, um, you know, $100 billion, you know, in 2019, which sounds like a pretty good year. Um, you know, they'll pay uh, corporate taxes on that. And then if, you know, there's some money left over, um, well, I mean, there's a hundred million even after they pay taxes, say they decide to put some back in the company and then maybe um, pay some dividends or whatever to investors based on you know, what they've already decided and the bylaws, um, you know, then, you know, that will be taxed as well. And then of course, any salary that any employees are paid is personal income as tax. Um, and so there's also a benefit corporation I'm just going to get into a ton of detail about that, but it's kind of similar to what we talked about with the L3C, where it's a corporation that has also uh, made a commitment to uh, some kind of social good or public benefit. Um, certain requirements, generally there's like a certification where you can be certified as a B Corp. Um, and then as far as tax elections, again, you can elect to be taxed as a traditional corporation, which is the double taxation or you can elect um, to be taxed as a pass-through entity where, you know, uh, the money made of income profits that are generated, um, your tax as personal income um, for the owners. Um, again, you know, you can change that election year to year, but once you make that election for a year, you generally can't change it, um, but the next tax year you could. See some of the advantages of the corporation. Uh, again, shareholders enjoy limited liability. You know, you can have a wide range of shareholders. You can have shareholders that work for the business. You know, the CEO can be a major shareholder, or uh, the CEO doesn't have to be a shareholder. You can have shareholders that don't do anything, which is you know, very often the case that the majority of shareholders don't actually participate in the management of a business. Um, but um, you know, some of them, many times they do. Raising additional funds is always possible through the sale of stock. It's just a lot easier. You can have stock in, you know, the reserve that you can issue, um, and it just gives you a lot more flexibility in in raising capital. And then a lot of investors, especially some of these more uh, like venture firms and things like that, tend to like to invest in corporations more just because it's easier easier for them to make the investment and to sell if they want to. Um, some of the disadvantages. Um, organizing, organizing a corporation is the most time consuming and the most expensive. Um, you know, statutorily, you're required to have certain meetings with shareholders every year and you have to have board meetings, and there's um, you know, sort of rules around what those board meetings 
meetings look like. So you get less flexibility. I mean, you generally with a corporation or the board to take a particular action, they need to have like a quorum, which is enough, um, you know, directors present at a meeting in order to vote on the matter. Um, majority. Um, whereas with an LOC, you know, I, you know, you don't necessarily have to do that. Um, and so it's definitely a lot more paperwork with corporations, um, but, you know, sometimes it makes sense for even small business to be a corporation and it's pretty manageable. Um, generally, the, it gets more complex, the more you know, owners you have and the bigger you get, um, as you can imagine, but, you know, um, you know, the extra additional that a small business would do, need to do to be a corporation versus an LLC uh, is real, but not uh, necessarily that much of a burden that corporation could be, shouldn't be considered. Um, oftentimes, um, businesses that are small businesses decide to be a corporation for tax benefits. And so, um, you know, certainly want to um, do all the math and, and consult with an accountant and a tax attorney when thinking about, you know, whether to be an LLC or corporation. It might just depend on, you know, what your particular, you know, strategy is around raising capital and expanding your business and what line of business you're doing and how you want to deduct, you know, uh, your business expenses. Um, you know, you, you know, forming a corporation and operating as a, as a C court may result in higher overall taxes, but there are some cases where that may not be true. So I just want to, again, speak with an accountant and all the details there. Um, you know, the state has really helpful guides for organizing a corporation. Um, so they sort of walk you through it yourself. And so I think it's certainly very good for folks to look into that. You can just Google Illinois Guide for Organizing a Corporation. Um, and that's a PDF document that's on the Secretary of State's website. There's one for corporations and for LLCs. You can Google both of those. There's a link in here. Um, you can send the slides around, but it's pretty easy to access. And even if you do go speak with an attorney, it's good to have a good sense of what all needs to be done. And and so, you know, you can take advantage of the time that you do spend speaking with an accountant or an attorney because you'll understand what they're talking about, understand what you need to do in order to form one. And formation here is, uh, you know, similar to an LLC. Um, you know, you file your articles of incorporation with the Secretary of State, which are similar to your articles of organization. Um, you pay filing fees, which are similar. Um, and then of course, you still got to have your business licenses. Uh, you prepare and adopt bylaws. Um, these, by, you know, bylaws can be, I've seen bylaws as short as like a couple pages, um, but generally you're probably about 10 to, you know, really big corporations. It could be, you know, they burn up a lot of paper, kill a lot of trees to, to, to draft their bylaws. It could be up to 50 pages or so, but you can do it pretty simply if you're a small company. Certainly, if you uh, you only have one shareholder, then it can be pretty simple until you decide to bring on others. Um, but then there's other certain certain corporate governance matters you generally need to take, which would be you know, having a corporate minute book, which is keeping track of the meetings that you hold and decisions, resolutions, which are decisions by the board. Um, you know, have you'd have a corporate seal, stock certificates, and um, some other things that you would have in your minute book. Um, and then there's certain corporate formalities, which we talked about, which are meetings and resolutions, which are generally votes or decisions made by the board. And then the last thing which we briefly touched on is the cooperative. Again, the cooperative, you can form a cooperative. Um, you can well, create a cooperative inside of like the structure of an LLC or a traditional corporation, but um, Illinois has created a couple entities uh, uniquely for cooperatives. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is a limited cooperative association. And so this is essentially three or more members, um, unless the sole member is a cooperative, meaning that, you know, you have a cooperative that is owned by another cooperative. But generally, a cooperative is three or more people um, that come together and decide to sort of share in the governance of a business. Um, and so it's similar to a corporation, um, you know, you have, you know, directors, some exceptions, and again, all the exceptions, always exceptions with, with legal entities and in the, in the law, but generally you would have to have directors, um, you have to have three 
um, unless you decide to essentially just have all the workers manage the business. And so the cooperatives is generally one member, one vote. Um, and so if you have 10 workers, each worker gets one vote, even if one of the workers is the CEO, their vote doesn't necessarily count more than the others. And, you know, um, you'll have laws which govern how, you know, company decisions are made. Again, with this limited cooperative association, you get limited liability protection. So, you know, the personal the members or the owners, um, you know, their personal assets aren't um, at stake in being through being involved in the business. Um, and then, you know, one of these other benefits is that, you know, you've probably heard of securities laws or the, um, the U.S. Securities uh, Exchange Commission. Um, you know, they regulate the exchange and the trade of ownership in companies. It's essentially, securities is uh, you know, sort of a security or a, uh, is like a stock and a stock would like represent a piece of ownership in a company or financial interest in a company. Um, and so there's certain requirements around when you can sell and you know, sort of trade uh, you know, these securities or the, these ownership, this ownership in a company. Um, but with cooperative, you're exempt from the state's rules. So the state has some and the federal government, the US government has some nationally for everyone. And then Illinois has its own unique rules around that with cooperative. You're generally exempt from that, which makes it a little easier to bring people on into the cooperative. Um, and then there's also the cooperative corporation, which is generally just a traditional corporation, but there's additional rules around, um, you know, the structure of, of that cooperative, uh, which are different from the limited cooperative association. Again, this is, these are like newer models. Um, and so definitely, would advise you to seek out an attorney if you want to form a cooperative. It's, it's kind of technical and some there's some some gray area just because it's such a new model. Um, again, some of the advantages, um, there's shared wealth and decision making. This is usually why people um, form cooperatives. They, you know, there's the opportunity to sort of build community wealth so that, you know, the, the you know, a lot of cooperatives are based in a particular community, whether it's like Logan Square, and the people that work in it, you know, generally live in that area and make all the decisions, and it's really integrated into the community versus, uh, you know, maybe a large, you know, grocery store chain, which is based out in some other state that you don't even know anything about the owners or anything. Um, so people form cooperatives to sort of localize the ownership and the control of businesses and their community. And again, there's the democratic control um, over, you know, how money is used and how the company is managed. That doesn't mean that you don't have, um, you know, some sort of internal structure and leadership. You can still have a CEO, CFO, and all that stuff. Um, but, you know, you don't have one sort of person that can just sort of dictate to everybody how things are going to happen. Um, some of the other advantages is that it, you know, really centers and uplifts workers so that workers have the opportunity need to have more of a say than they traditionally have in a business. Um, and then it's easier to, to create profit sharing structures with workers. Uh, generally, if workers have a say in the business, they're going to be like, we made $100 million this year. We should probably get some of that since we've done a lot of the hard work. Um, and then marketing, um, you know, sometimes, especially for smaller community-based businesses, um, people just like the sound of the word cooperative. You know, like, yeah, I want to be a part of that. Um, and then we talked about the securities law exemption, which can save some money um, and some paperwork. Uh, the disadvantages of it, you know, it's new, um, you know, potentially expensive, you know, unless you get pro bono uh, legal counsel. Um, it initially can be a little time consuming to sort of learn this new business structure um, and to set it up right. Um, certainly a, a, you know, a little bit of a challenge there, but definitely doable. Uh, a little bit less flexibility in raising capital through through equity, meaning ownership. And then there's um, some additional regulatory and organizational uh, things to think about here, um, as well as tax consideration. So the way you would form uh, a limited cooperative association is by filing articles of organization with the Secretary of State, um, and then you you know, generally you go with uh, the LLC form is what I've been told by the Secretary of State's office. And then you just, you know, clarify on there that you elect to be a limited cooperative association. And then otherwise it's kind of similar to 
uh, you know, an LLC or corporation, you file, you make your filing fees, um, you prepare and adopt your bylaws, um, you know, you have your corporate minute book, and then some organizational formalities, resolutions, meetings, you know, who's on, who's on the board, who's going to do what, uh, who can open bank accounts, all that stuff. Um, and then well, the main takeaway I want people to, well, the one thing I want people to walk away from uh, today is that it's not that one business structure is better. I often get calls and they say, which, which business structure is better? Which, you know, which one? Like, it just really depends. It's not that one is better than the other. It just depends on uh, your unique business model and situation and your strategy around race capital and liability and control and all the things that we talked about uh, throughout this presentation. And so, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you know, um, you know, attorneys and accountants can advise you on the consequences of particular choices, but can't necessarily tell you which one is better. Um, but, you know, oftentimes it, it does end up being the LOC or a corporation for a lot of folks, um, but that's not always the case. Um, and then, too, another important uh, takeaway from this is that uh, whatever decision you do make on the entity you choose, uh, it's not permanent. So you can change if you form an LLC, you can convert that into a corporation. Um, and so that, I mean, that's, that happens uh, pretty regularly. So, um, you know, it's not permanent, it's not the end of the world, um, but there are certain, certain sort of consequences depending on what you choose. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to touch on some legal resources uh, for small businesses. Of course, um, the ACP in the city of Chicago has a small business resources center, which right now is not open due to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and lockdown. But, um, you know, it was a, I think that you can still sort of call in and get information. You can obviously still apply for business licenses and get other help on zoning and, and related things. And, of course, they have a wonderful set of resources online, uh, which are really, really helpful, as does the Secretary of State um, of Illinois. Um, Illinois State Bar Association has um, a guide on uh, how to uh, form a corporation or an LLC um, that are really helpful. Uh, Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, my organization, uh, we run pro bono clinics and provide transactional assistance to uh, certain community partners. Uh, this is a list of our community partners. And so if you are, you know, uh, working with Urban Juncture and you're a member of their programming and, you know, Urban Juncture is like, all right, you're ready to start your business. You'll need to form an LLC and, you know, give your referral to us and we can help you uh, sort of form your entity and connect you with uh, pro bono attorneys who can uh, counsel you through. Um, so for Carpool, this is a pro bono uh, legal aid hotline um, that you can call or send questions to online. And uh, they can give you advice on a broad range of legal issues. Uh, another really good resource is the Justice Entrepreneur, uh, Entrepreneur Project. And these are private attorneys with flexible. And so the thing about pro bono legal services is that you have to qualify and there are certain conditions, uh, one of which the big one is um, income. So, you know, if you made a lot of money last year, you probably don't qualify for pro bono. Um, but, you know, project can do that for, for less, way less. So uh, that's another great resource. And then Illinois Legal Aid Online is, again, another general pro bono legal uh, aid organization that can answer questions and provide counseling online. And then the UIC John Marshall Law School uh, has a community enterprise and solidarity uh, economy clinic. It's basically a, uh, a clinic that provides uh, transactional legal assistance, uh, similar to what we provide a Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights to uh, small businesses and entrepreneurs. Uh, especially in historically uh, disinvested, underinvested communities. All right, now I think we will go to questions. Yes, thank you, so much. Lots of information. Sorry, Akili, I will have you muted uh, while I ask you the question, and then I will unmute you just so there isn't any background noise. 
We did have a lot of questions come in, so we will do our best to answer them. Uh, let's begin. First question was, what are the risks versus rewards of a series LLC? Let's see, okay, I, um, I heard the second part of this, our internet connection is a little spotty. So what are the uh, benefits versus the rewards of uh, forming a series LLC? What are the risks versus oh, okay. rewards? Okay, risk versus rewards. Um, I mean, you know, again, it depends on what you're comparing it against. I mean, the, the thing with a series LOC, and this is a newer model, is, um, you know, it's kind of like multiple LOCs within an LOC or multiple sort of businesses within an LOC. I mean, I haven't seen it widely used, to be honest. In private practice, I never, I never actually did any deals series LOCs, but I, I know maybe that's just because people haven't heard of them, uh, haven't, aren't as familiar with them. Um, what are the risks? Um, I mean, I think the risk, maybe there's a risk of some confusion around, you know, you know, which entity is which, not necessarily for the person that you know, owns the series LOCs, but maybe for other folks that are trying to uh, figure out corporate form and stuff uh, may be a little problematic if you're trying to you know merge with another business and maybe they don't want all these other series to come along and it probably makes more sense to just have separate LLCs where you can easily sort of just transfer the assets and not that you necessarily can't do that with those but um, you know I, I don't know I mean it, you know it's a newer thing I think it makes probably a lot of sense especially in the real estate context um, but um, yeah, I'll say that. I don't, I don't know if there's just, you know, just clear um, advantages to the series LOC. Great, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, I have more than one concept slash business. Is it smart to place them under one umbrella LLC and use a DBA for each or have them separate as LLCs? Okay. Yeah. I mean, again, here it depends on your unique situations. So I can't necessarily say for sure. I what I would generally do is have separate LLCs if you can afford it. And so, I mean, that's the big thing. If you if the the fees aren't a limitation, um, you know, because it can get a little pricey if you got like ten different lines of business and you you know you want to form a separate entity for each. Um, the assets of one um uh, you know to you know the other's liabilities so uh, i would separate those generally thank you next question can you explain assumed names slash dbas yeah so that's essentially just um you know the name you go by so I'm trying to think of a good example um you know say you know amazon corporation you know they go by you know when you go to their website it says amazon um but you know potentially the actual like top corporation the actual name is you know bob and john's corporate you know corporation you know that's sort of like what a, what a dba is sometimes like you know say llc 25 you know, is what you decide to call the actual legal entity that's going to own all the assets and stuff like that. But that's not an attractive name to go and open a store under. So you get a, a doing business, you know, as name or an assumed name, and that's your DBA. And you'll probably change that to, you know, you know, you know, Southside Ice Cream Parlor or something like that. And so it's just essentially just the name that you want, the sort of brand name that you want to attach to your business versus the actual legal name, which sometimes the brand name that you like may not always be available um, for an actual legal entity, or sometimes you don't want to call it that. You know, sometimes if you do a transaction or, you know, deal with someone, maybe you don't want the brand names, you know, the actual brand all over the contract and stuff for different reasons. And so um, an easy way to sort of to manage that is with ABA. 
Uh, just a general comment of thanks for the explanation on partnerships. I have a better understanding of liability on these entities. I think also you did a really good job um, just explaining all of these different entities. So I want to echo those good words. Our next question is, do all sole proprietors have to register with the state? I tried to complete the Reg 1 form and they were talking about taxes. I called and was told that I do not need to because I was not selling merchandise. I have I am a mental health therapist and slightly nervous about this. Mm, okay. Um, so for the sole proprietorship, I mean, so the entity uh, in and of itself, you know, you don't necessarily need to make any filings, but for your business license and your particular line of business, I mean, there may be, I'm sure there are certain uh, things that you need to make with the city. I don't know what all those are because it just depends on, you know, like for an ice cream shop, I don't know what all they need to file, but there are things they need to file. It's a retail business and there's certain rules and, you know, if you have a storefront and all these things like that, then there's rules if you're a service provider, like like you mentioned. Um, I'm sure that there are certain things that you do need to file. Um, I don't know what all those would be off the top of my head, but I would definitely, you know, Definitely want to get a good handle on that. I'm sure that this, the city's resources could help. And then, if you know, if you need, perhaps reach out to an attorney uh, who has some specialty in that, has a specialty in that area, who could sort of walk you through that. Um, but I think it, it sounds like what you're talking about is probably something more related to the actual business licensing versus uh, the creation of the of the entity. In this case, sole proprietorship is no entity, but um, it's separate from the actual legal standing of your business. Great, uh, just a quick announcement that this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. And that's at youtube.com backslash Chicago BACP. I'll post the link in the chat box there as well so you could reference it. Um, we do have a few very individualized questions of what's the best entity for this type of business or that type of business. You briefly talked about that, Akili. Can you again just mention, you know, what is a, the best option or how can someone figure out what they should be, um, you know, incorporating as? Yeah, um, you know, again, here it just depends. I know lawyers always say it depends. Um, but it, you know, it kind of it does. Um, you know, what do I recommend? Most of the time is the LLC for a small entrepreneur, um, especially um, you know, if you're going to be the only owner. You're going to have one other partner, or something like that. Nine times out of ten, I probably recommend the LLC. But again, that doesn't mean that that's the best one for uh, your particular circumstances, because it just depends on so many other factors, like you know, so many of the, the ones that we talked about. So what I recommend is like going through the presentation and for each one of the issues that we raised you know we talked about control um you know how you plan to raise capital you know flexibility costs all that stuff i would sort of map it out and look at your particular situation and say okay starting this kind of business this is the kind of control i need this is you know um this is how i plan to raise capital um this is how i want to govern it um you know and then once you've answered all those questions, then you can start to sell. I mean, what kind of liability protection do I need? You know, if you if your line of business is you know, liability exposure there is pretty minimal, and you're not going to really be doing much business, and you're not in a situation to spend you know a few hundred dollars on forming an LLC and sort of maintaining it or a corporation, then you know maybe the sole proprietor makes more sense. So you really got to sit down and do all that. Um, to really get a firm answer. I wish I could just give everyone a sort of general answer, like, yeah, you should just form an LLC, but that's, you know, it's not necessarily the case and sometimes not, not necessarily worth it, you know, uh, so it just depends. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, is a member of an LLC protected in all of the United States since it's state level? Yeah, so I mean, generally, yeah, you're protected. Um, you know, your personal assets are generally protected throughout the U.S. I mean, again, with that, I mean, each state has its own rules around, you know, 
business fraud and you know and actions that you take and wrongdoing and stuff like that or liability that you uh, incur so you know say you form an LLC in Illinois and you're doing you know you approved to do business in California you know California has its own rules about what sort of liability businesses are exposed to in California and just because you formed an LLC in Illinois doesn't mean that those Illinois state rules apply to your conduct in California. Um, but in general, you know, you know, all states do have, you know, they do allow for the creation of LLCs. With, you know, they have different rules around them. But generally, the idea is that they have limited, you know, liability and um, your personal assets are generally protected. Um, there but you know what that actually means in practice is going to be you know since a little different in each state good things a uh, couple people asked this question uh the difference between s corp and c corp um i know you touched on this if you could just either go back to the slide or just verbally um discuss the differences between the s corp and a c corp yeah let's see let me go back to the slide Yeah, okay, hold on the time there. So, yeah, so essentially uh, the C Corp is a corporation that elects to be taxed at the corporate level. And then, you know, anything that, you know, the owners or employees are paid is taxed as personal income. So there's double taxation. So, you know, you can say that, you know, corporate tax rate is whatever it is, 20 some odd percent. And so, you know, you, you know, generate $100 billion, you know, that's taxed at that level and then you know you want to pay out some of that you know that's left over to individuals and they receive it and you get 50 billion dollars from that 100 billion dollars well that's taxed again um and so you know maybe the 100 billion dollars cut down to 75 or so and then you know then you say you get the remaining 75 and then you know your personal income tax is like 35 percent or whatever um and that's, you know, so there's that double taxation as opposed to, you know, if you were a corporation and you elect to be taxed as an S Corp, then, you know, you make $100 million, then that's, you know, $100 million of income, personal income to you, and that just gets taxed as personal income at one time. So if that makes sense, it's the double taxation is the issue, is the difference. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question is, do I need to have bylaws for a LLC? Yeah, great question. No, you don't have to have, to have bylaws for an LLC. Essentially, um, what the bylaws for an LLC are uh, or would be is the operating agreement. And the operating agreement has the same sort of function as bylaws do for a corporation. So corporation has bylaws, LLC has an operating agreement. Uh, partnerships have a partnership agreement. And so uh, for the LLC, you don't have to have an operating agreement, but you pretty much always should. Um, and, you know, if it's a single member LLC, meaning a single owner, you're the only owner, um, you know, there's no other parties and, you know, whether or not you have an operating agreement, you know, it's not that as big of a deal. Um, but, you know, if there's more than one owner and, you know, it's anything remotely but a complex or bigger than just one person, then you should have an operating agreement, which is like bylaws, but it's different. Uh, in that, you know, an operating agreement is actual agreement, but it covers the same terms that you would have in bylaws. So you can think about it that way. Bylaws is not really something that uh, a whole bunch of different parties agree to. They do, but it's adopted by um, the corporation and by its board of directors and its shareholders versus the operating agreement is just formed usually right after the LLC is formed and sort of sets out who the owners are um, and how it's going to be run is generally adopted by the owners slash members. Okay. So we have a couple questions about switching. Um, one of them says, can you start your business as an LLC, then change it to a corp if it becomes larger slash more successful? For example, when a mom and pop shop becomes popular and expands nationwide, 
And then a separate person asked, uh, with the LLC, can they change to be taxed as an S corp? So can you touch on about um, changing from one entity or um, incorporating to another? What's the process and are there benefits or risks to it? Yeah, so yeah, definitely uh, this happens all the time. So, you know, mom and pop shop, you know, they open a grocery store or let's just choose McDonald's, uh, you know, open a cheeseburger place, uh, you know, back in 1950 and it's an LLC. And, you know, now it's 2010 and, you know, we have, you know, a thousand stores across the country, I'm sure they buy more than that, but, um, you know, at some point they likely, you know, converted from an LLC to a corporation um, just to give them more flexibility to grow their business. And that's really common, happens all the time, and you can definitely do that. Um, the process, depending on where you are and your size and complexity, can be a little uh, complicated or expensive. But if you're still relatively small, um, you know, there's, um, you know, there's this articles of conversion or, I think that's the name of them, but there's basically this conversion document that you can find on the Secretary of State's website that you would need to uh, fill out in order to convert from an LLC to a corporation. Um, and so you follow that, and then once it's approved, you know, you know, you sort of become a corporation, and then you have to take all the, you know, other steps and stuff as you, in, you know, um, that you would need to in order to be a corporation. So you go from your operating agreement to bylaws and and all that but uh, you can definitely convert. And then there was a, and the other question was about um, S Corp. If you are an LLC, can you elect to be, elect to be taxed as an S Corp, I think, or something? Um, so generally the way that the, this works is that um, the S Corp election, election is essentially electing to be taxed like an LLC uh, or standard LLC where you know, all the profits and losses are, you know, income or losses to uh, the actual owners of the business. The difference is the LLC can also elect to be taxed like a corporation, which, uh, you know, where we mean the double taxation. And so they could elect to, um, you know, be taxed one at the, you know, sort of in the level, the LLC, the business level. So anything that, you know, they, any money that they generate will be taxed. And then, you know, any money that's distributed to employees is taxed as personal income. So they can be double taxed as opposed to, you know, sort of standard uh, taxation for LOCs is um, the LOCs, you know, profits only being taxed as personal income uh, at one time to the owners. All right, next question, and we only have time for a couple more questions. Um, I believe the next two are pretty relevant to many of our attendees in terms of the information to be shared. So the first one is, I will be setting up as a LLC as a wholesaler, wholesale supplier to businesses. As such, I will not have to collect sales tax on sales, correct? What, if anything, will be required of my customers so not to be charged sales tax. Uh, yeah, I can't, I'm, I, you know, I, I can't speak to that particular situation. I, I would like to recommend you speak with a, an attorney and get some particulars on that. Um, wouldn't, but I do know what you're talking about, this uh, sales tax exemption, but there are some other uh, rules around that. So I, I, you know, I just definitely recommend you speak with an attorney to get those full scope of what that looks like and what that would mean for you. Um, that's a little bit outside of the uh, issue of what sort of entity uh, form and stuff, so. Uh, but definitely an important question. If you don't mind, Akili, maybe going back to your last slide that provided um, different resources for people for looking for, um, I think it was not only legal, yep, there it is, legal resources. So once again, you guys want to jot down these organization names. We are also going to post this webinar on our YouTube page. So you will be able to reference it there as well. And then um, final question. When establishing a LLC for rental property ownership, is it advisable to switch any relevant utilities, insurances, or mortgages 
from the private owner to the LLC? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I probably would. Um, I wouldn't want to have, um, you know, any utilities for a business in my own personal name. Um, you know, even if I'm the owner of the business, so I don't want any and all liabilities and obligations for a business to be in the business entity's name. So, you know, uh, now for when it comes to rental properties and all that, I mean, that gets a little bit more caught need to be in the actual title holder's name. Maybe it's in the um, management company's name. That's probably what you would most often see is, you know, um, you know, one entity owns the actual real estate and then maybe another entity manages that property and has the right or the authority to take certain actions, including setting up utilities and things and stuff. So, um, you know, maybe that's what you see and, and it just depends and that's a little bit outside of my area of expertise but um i wouldn't want my own individual name so great thank you um, so we definitely had several comments come in i'm just saying how informative this webinar is so i'm going to echo those words it was very informative and we just want to thank you for taking the time to be with us today on this webinar, once again, look at this slide, everyone. We do have a bunch of legal resources mentioned on the slide. Um, we will be posting this webinar up to our YouTube page, and you could find that link over in the chat box, uh, hopefully within the next couple of days. Um, Akili, do you have any parting words? Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Um, definitely enjoyed uh, sharing this information with you all and thought the questions are really great. I appreciate all the positive feedback and, um, you know, again, definitely take advantage of these resources. Um, you know, in particular, you know, the Justice Entrepreneurship uh, Project, you know, and of course our uh, pro bono legal services, um, you know, and then again, best of luck to you all and your ventures. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good rest of your day.